This is November the 15th, 2015, and our lesson title is From Derby to Philippi. It's from our printed text, the Standard Lesson Commentary, and our devotional reading is Matthew, the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 22. Our background scripture is Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 15. And our key verse is Acts 16, verse 10. Our printed text is actually Acts, the 16th uh, chapter, verses 1 through 5, and also 8 through 15. And our lessons aims for this Sunday's Sunday School message is list the significant events in Paul's travels through Derby, Lystra, Troas, and Philippi, and compare and contrast Paul's decision to circumcise Timothy with Paul's opposite decision regarding Titus. So this will begin our indulgence into this Sunday's Sunday School lesson and again it is titled From Derby to Philippi. This lesson marks the second act of Paul's missionary work. Um, this is his second missionary journey and in his first journey he had uh, visited and had began an evangelistic work in Presidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. And uh, the change in the actual locations of his visits in this uh, second journey here uh, although in the first missionary work his uh, adventures ended in Derby on this one here it actually starts in Derby so there is a significant note that this is an extension uh, this is to carry on the work that he had began on uh, his first missionary work and also uh, it also is not to negate that the work that had been begun was finished uh, because although he didn't return into the area for his first missionary work uh, the text uh, explains to us that Barnabas and John Mark uh, were still in that area and so there was no need for Paul to return to the area where his first missionary encounters had already been placed and were already in the working. So therefore, uh, the Lord chose to send him beyond that point and then, uh, shall we say, to encounter some new soil, uh, to go into some new areas. And also, uh, we should be mindful of the fact that uh, this is during uh, a time of a expansion in Roman colonies. Uh, in fact, towards the end of our lesson, where uh, one of the most significant acts of this lesson will be lifted uh, in the area of Philippi, uh, this is a colony of Rome. And uh, there is an infusion of many different cultures and customs and different um, living styles and beliefs as well uh, in these areas. So this area is somewhat infused with a lot of different activities and also it is a fertile soil uh, for the teachings of Christ and the missionary work of Paul 
as well as the other workers who were in this practice of getting the teachings of Christ out uh, to areas that uh, were not familiar with it, as well as people who were already followers of the teachings of Christ and uh, were residing in these different areas. Verses 1 and 2 of our lesson uh, begin to set the tone uh, for uh, some of the early considerations that Paul uh, had to uh, entertain as uh, he set forth to begin this second uh, missionary journey. Uh, the scripture says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman whose name is Eunice, his mother, which was a Jew and believed, but his father was Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. And one of the things that's significant uh, about this relationship between uh, Paul and Timothy, uh, first of all, is the significance of Paul's rep I mean, of Timothy's reputation, uh, his name, uh, in a sense, uh, already denoting uh, what uh, the purpose of this young man's future was for his name in itself meant one who honors God. And in the ancient times, uh, also uh, even significant in today's times, uh, when a child's name is chosen, uh, there should be significant consideration given to the name that is selected for the child. Because in ancient times, names meant something. Uh, they were to identify the wishes and the desires of the parents at the time of the birth of the child to send forth a purpose that uh, children are the reward of God. They are the parents for a time. Uh, therefore, there is a purpose for their life. And so the names were selected to identify to the child, what does my name mean? But what were the thought processes uh, at the time of my birth? And how did the Spirit of God convey to you uh, what name should be rendered unto me to identify what is that spiritual intervention? Uh, how did that uh, determine what my name should be, what my purpose in life should be? So first of all, we recognize that Paul's name has significance to it, and it simply says, one who honors God. Uh, secondly, uh, Paul's reputation had already uh, carried through the area in which he resided. So uh, he was spoken of as a disciple, uh, one who believed in Jesus and was an active, an active, an active member in the church. And then it also speaks of his rearing, uh, his, uh, his counsel, his, his direction, uh, from his parents and it identifies his mother and his grandmother and it uh, talks about uh, the character of his mother it says that she was a Jew she was also a Christian so she was not a part of the set that uh, was more Jewish than they were Christ-like uh, she was not a part of that division uh, she was a Christian Jew. She believed in the teachings of Christ and also uh, was one who practiced the teachings of the faith of Judaism, the Old Testament teachings. Uh, it also uh, mentions that uh, Timothy's father was Greek 
and uh, somewhat implying that because he was Greek, he was not definitely not Jewish. Uh, also, that um, the scripture does not tell us that he was one who believed in the teachings of Christ. Uh, he was Greek, though. Uh, and so here it kind of uh, impresses upon us that uh, Paul's rearing the focus on his mother and his grandmother indicates to us that the father was not present. Now, either the father may have died or maybe there was a divorce between the mother and the father or even abandonment. Maybe the father uh, just wasn't present, but uh, the rearing, therefore, of Timothy uh, and uh, the reputation that he had developed uh, for among the other followers in this area. Um, that was developed by the rearing of his mother and his grandmother. They were very significant in his life, as many women are very significant in the lives of their children, uh, sometimes even more so when the father is not present. So uh, when we continue into the lesson, we also recognize that there was an obstacle that Paul uh, considered. Uh, that obstacle was the fact that he wanted to make sure that Timothy was fully prepared for the work that was before him. Uh, Paul wanted to remove any distractions or any obstacles or any hindrances that may impede the flow of his work. Uh, this here is basic, basically set around the practice of circumcision, which uh, was a uh, honored uh, practice among the Jews and um, as we have been taught through scripture it was uh, an obstacle a stumbling block that was used in the early setting of the church uh, because the Gentiles uh, were not that was not a physical or a religious uh, practice among the Gentiles uh, specifically the early Greeks uh, circumcision was not uh, something that they practiced and this was a act of cleanliness uh, to the Jewish faith uh, among the men uh, it was almost as though it was a rites of passage and so uh, Paul recognized that uh, as Timothy was coming forth and would engage with Gentiles as well as those from the Jewish or the Jerusalem council, the synagogue, um, Paul recognized that this would be an issue that would be brought before him and to try and remove any hindrances or obstacles that uh, would cause uh, delay or agitation in his early ministry. Uh, Paul wanted to make sure that Timothy was fully prepared. Uh, and so therefore, um, uh, Paul wanted to uh, take Timothy as his own son and to make sure that he had done all that he was aware of to try and prepare him. Now, there is a uh, distinction here that the text lists um, concerning this whole issue of circumcision for uh, we recognize that uh, this had become a um, great debate among the uh, Jewish council uh, and Paul in his early uh, uh, mission work of preaching to the Gentiles. And so uh, one of the things that was listed is, is why was Paul so uh, adamant about this issue 
of circumcision not being required uh, for the Gentiles, but yet he wanted to make sure that Timothy was circumcised. And um, one is, is to remove barriers that hinder uh, God's mission work in reaching all people. Uh, Paul understood that first we must have the teaching go forth and then from the teaching and from the preaching of God's word when the mind and the heart changes then other practices among the faith uh, will be received but to place that as a barrier first and say until this is done uh, the teachings and the preaching of God's word is null and void. Uh, so Paul did not want this to uh, become a hindrance uh, and uh, as so as though it is a requirement that you must first do this before you can receive the teachings of salvation and before you can become whole. Uh, the, also it is lift, listed that uh, Titus, who was a Greek, um, uh, he, uh, Paul identifies this in Galatians, uh, the second chapter and the third verse. Now, Titus, Paul tells us uh, in Galatians uh, 2 and 3 again, that Titus, uh, who was a Greek, he was compelled to be circumcised. Now, this was because of scripture identifies these men as false brethren who were secretly brought in among the group, among the council. Uh, they were like spies. They came in and their intention was that they were observing somewhat in the shadows. Uh, they were agitators and they were looking for different things that uh, they could use to manipulate the purpose of this new ministry. And so Paul identifies this uh, to uh, bring again the discussion, the great up uproar over this issue of circumcision. Uh, and he identifies here how that God is no respect of person. He doesn't show favoritism. And so how he reminds the council of how God had uh, blessed the works of Peter with those who were circumcised, but also blessed the works of Paul with those who were not circumcised. So uh, here, Paul still is bringing up how uh, at the wish of different men in these councils, how they would use certain acts. Now, circumcision was the one that was lifted, but how that they would use certain practices to try and denounce the teaching to other people. Uh, and so this Paul brings up uh, just to bring remembrance to remember Titus and how uh, he was compelled, uh, though he was Greek, he was compelled to be circumcised. And this was done because different men uh, among the council who uh, tried to appear themselves as being noteworthy. These were uh, supposed to be men of uh, great reputation or, or statue or what have you. And uh, they actually uh, uh, did not live up uh, to the recognition that was rendered unto them. They were supposed to be like, you know, well known. And uh, if we can, you know, comply with their wishes and what have you, uh, this would be, you know, kind of a blessing on our purpose and what have you. And these men actually were contrary to that. They were just, uh, uh, shall we say, spies that were seated among uh, the group. And their practice was is to try and manipulate the purposes. Now, let us go further into um, 
the real another very significant issue uh, in this lesson. Uh, but as we uh, think about that, uh, moving from one fact one factor to another, uh, how many uh, times have we tried to carry out the work of God? And there have been those among us who try to nitpick and find uh, certain issues that they can use to try and discourage the work that is set before the church. Uh, to try and find uh, little tangible things that they can say, hey, these people aren't doing this, uh, they have that. Uh, they're, they're not uh, following in this light. Uh, therefore, we shouldn't uh, waste our efforts and our time and our uh, 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 ambition uh, should not be uh, directed towards them. So uh, we have to really be cognizant and aware of people who uh, try and throw stones and hide their hands. Uh, in the practice of trying to get the teaching out uh, to all for God again as we say is not a respecter of persons but uh, God's will is that none should perish so let's not waste our time jumping through hoops trying to appeal to the desires of men that run contrary to the will of God now as we look here we um, there are two verses that have very uh, significant factors here uh, following verse four and five the two verses are verses six and seven and those two verses are not uh, a part of the printed text but they precede the uh, vision that Paul received in verse eight and it talks about uh, his uh, coming in, passing by Messiah, um, and came down to Troas. Uh, when we look at this here, there is some significance to uh, this route that he was coming through. And it talks about how Paul intended, as he was traveling through this region, he intended to go to Ephesus, one of the largest cities in the empire. But the Holy Spirit overruled that wish of Paul's in the sixth verse. And uh, it talks about how Bithynia, that uh, this here was another area of great significance. And uh, Paul was thinking about maybe we could go through here. Uh, because these cities uh, uh, had a large population, they were recognized. And so uh, they had significance when we begin to equate them with other areas in this same region. But the Holy Spirit had something else in mind. And it uh, uh, directed Paul to bypass his own wishes and his own desire and sent him in another direction and so a lot of times uh, we have to also uh, recognize that um, sometimes along this missionary work in this journey uh, we have uh, desires and wishes of our own uh, which is natural uh, in our humanness that uh, we too are attracted to the things that we see with our eyes, our eyes, our eyes. and also uh, we are attracted uh, to the recognition that are given to certain places, certain people, certain things, and uh, many times that's not always the will of God. God has other purposes. And so when we come to uh, verse 9, uh, Paul tells us that he received a vision 
And in the vision, there was a man of Macedonia and prayed to him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And Paul's response to this was, is that it was a simple request. Yes, it had very significant and dramatic uh, outcomes from it. And uh, when Paul recognized that this is why the spirit deterred him from going in the route that he chose, that now he recognized that Paul, that God had a more prevailing issue and that he, his and God's intention was to send Paul into this direction because here was an area that was yearning for the teachings of Christ. Uh, here was an area that was in need of the preachings of the Christ, the salvation. Um, these people were actually looking for this. And so this is where uh, Paul recognizes that, oh, uh, so now I understand why the Spirit hindered me from trying to fulfill my own wishes and my own will. And this is what God really had intended for us. And so there's a footnote here in our lesson I would like to lift. And it says, uh, this lets us sense the urgent need for foreign ministries today. Now, foreign ministries don't always have to be outside of our border. Sometimes our foreign ministries might be just within the neighborhood. It's an area that still is foreign to us because we haven't tapped those people, those people uh, in that uh, neighborhood. We haven't reached out beyond the boundaries outside our church walls. So foreign doesn't always have to be on some distant shore. It can be on a distant or a near neighborhood, but we've made it distant because we haven't reached out to it. Uh, but uh, it says it is not so much our churches saying, go, they need you. But the unvangelized in other areas saying, come, we desperately need you. And our neighborhoods and communities uh, within our area, there are people that are crying out saying, come, we desperately need you. Now, verse 11 and 12 um, build upon each other. Uh, it talks about the distances that Paul uh, traveled in order to finally reach the destination and fulfill the purpose of his second missionary journey that God had already set and already had prepared and just uh, waiting for Paul's arrival for him to recognize what God had already created and set in place and already had ordained uh, for this event to come into fruition. But it talks about how uh, once uh, Paul was uh, leaving Troas, uh, as he came into Samotracia and also Neapolis, and it talks about the distances between these areas. Uh, one 45 miles north of Troas, and then the uh, next day, how he had to take a ship and travel at night, and then go into Neapolis, uh, 70 miles from his previous destination. And uh, it, it speaks about the preparation of the trip and the distances. And when we think of this at the conclusion, um, it says that a soul is never too far away for God's purpose to be fulfilled. Uh, that uh, no matter what our distances are, how far away or no matter what the 
may be perceived complications uh, in the journey, uh, the accommodations that must be made, the cost, uh, the uh, actual uh, interaction between the one means of travel to another, uh, whatever the price, whatever the cost, whatever the uh, accommodations that must be addressed in order to fulfill God's purpose, distance and cost and uh, the different uh, preparations that must be made along the way. None of these things are seen as obstacles or hindrances in the way of God's work. And then we recognize that Paul eventually winds up in Philippi, and this is one of the largest uh, cities in Macedonia. Uh, it, it has a lot of uh, recognition, a historical establishment. Uh, Philip II of Macedonia is the ruler here and uh, his son Alexander following him and this uh, area actually was colonized by Rome and the city received uh, a, a lot of Rome's uh, um, um, involvement uh, its uh, uh, army um, members who served in the military of Rome actually used this place as a retirement home. Uh, it became one of the main passageways of trade and commerce. Uh, it was a developed area for Rome. And so um, Paul now arrives here and then God's purpose for his mission for Paul is fulfilled in the 13th, 14th, and the 15th verse of the lesson. And it talks about how Paul meets a woman on the Sabbath day. It's not in the synagogue, but he meets a group of women that were set on a riverside by the side of a river, and they were meeting to pray. And as they sat down, uh, Paul began to speak and to teach to the women. And there is a certain woman here who's identified among the group. And one of the things that we should recognize here is what was one of the customs of a gathering or an assembly. And uh, the script, the tech tells us that uh, one of the requirements for a assembly is, is that it had to be at least 10 Jewish men, not Jewish women, Jewish men, the age of 12 or over to actually constitute a synagogue or an assembly meeting. But here, no men are present, just women. One of the women that were present there is Lydia. And this woman had uh, skills. This woman uh, sold uh, linen. She was uh, uh, viewed as a woman of wealth. And the linen that she sold, it was uh, not considered just to be uh, any a uh, common type, but this was uh, a luxury item. It was identified that it was presented in purple and the, that color had to be purchased from a certain area. So this woman was a business woman. Uh, she was uh, uh, very um, involved in her business and she had business savvy. Uh, so, but the text renders something that was even more significant than her ability uh, to be involved in commerce. But it also rendered the fact of her heart. And it talked about how that from that gathering where Paul and Timothy were meeting with the women whose 
assembled by the riverside. It talked about how uh, this woman's heart was opened up to what the Lord conveyed to her as Paul spoke. And she attended to the things which were spoken. And as a result of the fact that beyond the fact that she was not a woman who was destitute, she was not one who was in need, but this woman uh, was already well taken care of. She already uh, had uh, provided the things that were needed in her life in a very competitive area. Uh, so this woman was not someone who uh, was, shall we say, prone to receive uh, teachings of salvation, of freedom, of, uh, of being uh, removed from uh, suppression or, or from the stresses of life. Uh, this woman's uh, heart was in the right place. And therefore, when the scripture says that uh, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended to the things which were spoken of Paul, uh, she was not just seeking the riches, but she was seeking also the desire of the Lord in her life. And so Paul identifies this, and as a result, not only her, but because she inquired of Paul and said, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us, is the response of what Paul lifted in the 15th verse, that she was baptized and her whole household and they all besought uh, this whole initiative here saying that if you have judged us to be faithful then come into my house and abide there and so we see that the final conclusion of this whole mission work that it appears as though God was bypassing certain areas that were uh, recognized. They, um, they were large in terms of the number of people that were residing there. And yet, uh, God had another purpose. And his purpose was to go into another region. And it is identified that this was one of the first evangelistic uh, in initiatives or endeavors that reached beyond Asia Minor and actually went into the regions of Europe. And so uh, this act took place, and the, and the text identifies that this act actually took place uh, not in the pursuit of a man, but in the pursuit of a woman. And it is very unfortunate that even today that women are uh, treated still as second class citizens. Their status is still uh, uh, perplexed in the minds of many men in religious settings that they are not equal. But as we look at the teachings of Christ and as we look at the lesson here, the significance of the lesson in its conclusion is based on how the woman and her household were brought into the teachings of God and baptized and saved and how that was uh, passed as a complement to the works of what Paul was able to do through fulfilling the will of God and therefore he was invited into her household and this began the mission work going beyond the borders of Asia into Europe so 
as we recognize the purpose of the lesson, uh, let us be mindful of the fact that through fulfilling God's will, it will take us beyond certain borders, beyond certain barriers, uh, into regions that God has already ordained in his work. And all he needs is some willful participants to carry out the will of God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.